Well, aloha everyone, and welcome back to Human Nutrition here at Chaminade University. Today we are going to be delving into Unit uh, 9, we'll be talking about alcohol. We'll talk about how alcohol is absorbed after you consume it. We'll talk about how it's metabolized throughout the body and its effect, both harmful effects and also some beneficial effects, mainly some harmful effects on the body. Um, we'll talk about different types of cancers that are associated with alcohol consumption and potential health benefits of, again, moderate alcohol consumption. So alcohol is not considered an essential nutrient. That means you could survive your entire lifetime with never ever touching a drop of it. And the main type of alcohol that adult um, humans consume is in the form of ethanol. It's the um, main form of alcohol that we consume in most of our alcoholic beverages. Now, it is safe for consumption, but if we drink it in excessive amounts, it can lead to toxicity and can be fatal, um, as well as have severe other social effects as well as dependency effects. Um, typically, it's made by fermentation. You can either ferment natural sugars that are found in grains, and that's how you make things like beer or malt beverages, or fermentation of things that are in fruits, like wines made from grapes, etc. And then it, if we're talking about hard liquor, that's basically going to be a concentrated alcohol that's collected through distillation after fermentation has occurred. So what's in an alcoholic beverage? Um, mainly it's water, ethanol, which is what you think of when you think of your alcohol content and what just has to be labeled on the beverage itself. Um, but there's also going to be a lot of hidden sugars, and oftentimes those sugars are not listed. Calories are not typically listed on alcoholic beverages. Um, and calories come from both the carbohydrate content, content that we were just talking about and the sugar content, as well as the alcohol concentration itself. Um, and when we talk about a drink, it's going to be different volumes depending on what we're talking about because we're going to have different concentrations of alcohol. So the definition of a drink is going to be five fluid ounces of wine. Again, notice that this glass is approximately half full. So if you were to pour yourself what you consider to be a full glass of wine, you're actually consuming two glasses of wine. So a glass of wine, a pour is considered to be five ounces. Um, for beers, it's 12 fluid ounces or one bottle or one can, etc. And then one and a half fluid ounces of distilled spirits. So one shot would be one and a half fluid ounces. Now alcohol is going to be absorbed very quickly throughout your entire gastrointestinal tract. So absorption is going to start almost immediately and it's all absorbed by um, simple diffusion. 20% of it will be absorbed uh, before it's even left the stomach. And it's going to make it through all of the compartments of the body that are going to be aqueous or water containing. And as you may know, that's pretty much everything. Now, most of that alcohol is going to be metabolized by the liver and some of it's going to be excreted in the urine and some of it is going to be eliminated via the lungs. So when the police officer pulls you over for a suspected DUI and he asks blood, breath, or urine, this is because these are the three places that you're going to be able to find alcohol in the blood, in the breath, and in the urine or the metabolites of the breakdown of alcohol, for example. Um, so alcohol is a, a toxin. Your body wants to eliminate it very quickly. So your body's objective is to break it down and metabolize it. Um, again, we absorb alcohol first in our stomach and then in our small intestines, so throughout the gastrointestinal tract. And some of it's going to be metabolized by an enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. Now, alcohol dehydrogenase will break down alcohol, and it'll do that before it's absorbed, meaning that it, it will lessen the effects of your alcohol um, your intoxication. Now, some people, particularly people of Asian descent, for example, have a deficiency in alcohol dehydrogenase, and they end up flushing under the skin and um, end up drunk earlier than someone who perhaps has normal levels of alcohol dehydrogenase. So you have to be very careful if you come from an Asian descent and you don't have the normal levels of alcohol dehydrogenase in your body when you are consuming alcohol. And it's the same thing with women. Women are going to be um, more susceptible to alcoholic effects than men, and again, that has to do with the concentration of alcohol dehydrogenase. Um, so so women have less by about 20 to 30 percent alcohol dehydrogenase than men do, so they're going to absorb more alcohol in the stomach because less alcohol is going to be broken down by alcohol dehydrogenase. Um, additionally, if you eat something, so if you put something in your stomach, that's going to slow your alcohol absorb or absorption because your stomach is going to be busy absorbing other nutrients as well. So it's always best to drink on a full stomach if you are going to go out and imbibe. Um, here's a demonstration of their blood alcohol levels. Women are depicted in blue and men in uh, red. And basically what happens after you consume that alcohol is you're going to get a spike in your blood alcohol level and then it's going to start to dissipate over time. And again, women, because they have less de alcohol dehydrogenase, are going to absorb more, more quickly, and then have to break it down for a longer period of time. So it takes them a little bit longer, about three and a half hours as opposed to four hours, to get to the point where your blood alcohol level is low enough to be considered non-intoxicated. Okay, so how do we metabolize 
alcohol. So as I've mentioned, alcohol metabolism begins in the stomach. So some alcohol is going to be metabolized by that specific enzyme we talked about, alcohol dehydrogenase. Um, but whatever doesn't get broken down by alcohol dehydrogenase is going to get absorbed through the stomach. And if there's any food in the stomach, this is going to help slow down the absorption of alcohol. Um, so again, if you wanted to try to imbibe, you would want to do so on a full stomach. Um, and then once the alcohol reaches the small intestines, the small intestines are, of course, the site of most nutrient absorption. Um, and that's going to be, play the same role for alcohol, even though it's a non-nutrient. Most alcohol is going to get absorbed in the small intestines. And then it's going to get metabolized in the liver. But if it's not metabolized, it'll end up recirculating throughout the body. Um, and it'll end up hitting parts of the body, including the brain, which is what we think of when we think of being drunken. All right. So how do we break down alcohol? We have two uh, major pathways. One is that alcoholic dehydrogenase that I talked about, sorry, alcohol dehydrogenase or ADH, and it's going to break down small amounts of alcohol. So if you were to have small amounts of alcohol in your system, you might never actually get drunk, even if you were to continuously imbibe small amounts, because alcohol dehydrogenase would break it down for you, so it would never even get into your bloodstream. But we also have microsomal ethanol oxidizing system, or MEOS, and this is going to be responsible for breaking down um, large amounts of alcohol. So if we end up to the point where you have overwhelmed alcohol dehydrogenase capabilities, then we enter into the microsomal ethanol oxidizing system. And that works kind of like this. All right, so both alcohol dehydrogenase and MEOS serve to break down alcohol into acetaldehyde. All right, they do that for two different ways, um, but they're both going to basically be breaking it down into acetaldehyde. Acetaldehyde is then going to get bro broken down by aldehyde dehydrogenase to make acetyl-CoA. And if you're familiar with um, the citric acid cycle, you know that acetyl-CoA is going to be um, a pretty good it's going to go directly into the citric acid cycle. But if we are unable to metabolize acetyl-CoA by putting it into the citric acid cycle, which sometimes happens if we're going to have a lot of alcohol breakdown because breakdown of alcohol at acetaldehyde, acetaldehyde, it's going to release electrons um, that we can use to make ATP so we can get energy, but at the same time, it's going to inhibit the citric acid cycle, which limits the breakdown of acetyl-CoA. That means that we're going to actually be building more fats, so more fatty acids and more triglycerides than we would normally because we can use some of the alcohol for metabolism and therefore we're less reliant on the citric acid cycle. So some of this acetyl-CoA that's created by the breakdown of acetaldehyde, acetaldehyde is going to be stored in the form of fat and triglycerides. Right. Um, so in this way, we can break down alcohol, again, through either alcohol dehydrogenase to acetaldehyde. Um, now, acetaldehyde, again, it's going to be toxic, so we want to break it down pretty quickly. And again, we do that by aldehyde dehydrogenase, making this acetyl-CoA. All right, so what happens to alcohol when it actually bypasses the liver, right? We've drank, we have taken in enough of it that it's going to get back into circulation and now it's going to end up having an effect on your brain. So it's a depressant, works in the central nervous system to slow down the transmission of nervous impulses and also slows down your reaction time to certain stimuli, well to all stimuli. It impairs your thoughts, your actions, your behavior, it reduces your impulses. Um, sorry, it is going to affect multiple areas of the brain. And the more you consume, the more areas of the brain are going to be affected. And eventually, we can end up actually with alcohol poisoning and even death can occur if we can't hit the parts of the brain that are responsible for brainstem activities, such as breathing and heart rate. Now, here's the progressive effects of alcohol, starting with low alcohol concentration to higher blood alcohol concentration. Um, and it, in most states, the illegal limits for driving or the legal limits for driving are 0 0.08 or lower. Some states are still um, 0.1, but generally it's 0 0.08, and that's going to be just a couple drinks in. So 0 0.05 down to none is going to give you just slight relaxation, sense of well-being, a little bit of loss of inhibition. Your central or cerebral cortex is going to be affected, and you're going to have a little bit um, reduced alertness and impaired judgment. As we get a little bit higher, 0.06 to 0.1, um, we end up with a little bit of numbing, pleasure feelings. So we sometimes we get nauseous. Those individuals end up vomiting at this point. Um, sleepiness. Sometimes they'll just go and sleep it off. Sometimes you also get heightened emotion, so emotional arousal, things like tears and mood swings. Um, the regions of the brain affected include cerebral cortex and now the forebrain, so a little bit further as well. This can get to the point where we're starting to affect coordination, specifically things like fine motor skills as well as visual tracking. So one of the things that they'll do um, when I say visual tracking, I mean watching your eyes go from left to right as you're moving a pencil or something in front. So one of the things that a police officer will do is they'll ask you to track their pen light or to tra track their finger as they move left and right to see that your eyes are following whatever it is that you're asked to follow. 
As we get a little bit higher, we're certainly in the we should not be driving range, 0.1 to 0.2, we're entering into mood swings, great sadness, great anger, sometimes mania, people can get highly manic. This is because we are now getting into areas like the cerebellum. So we're not only affecting the cerebral cortex and the forebrain, but we're also affecting the cerebellum. This means that we can have issues with our reasoning, might end up sounding things out that seem logical that are not logical to other people. Um, issues with depth perception. Um, also, with what is appropriate social norms. As we get a little bit higher, 0.21 to 0.3, oftentimes we end up into reduced sensations. This is where people would be able to um, let someone, for example, perform a small surgery on them or something, right? Um, they can also sometimes get highly aggressive or highly depressed, and sometimes they'll fall into just a stupor where they'll just kind of stand and stare at a wall. And that's because we are now entering to the point where we are affecting the brainstem. So not just the cerebral cortex and the forebrain and the cerebellum, but now the brainstem. And once we get into the brainstem, we enter into areas where we're affecting capability to make basic decisions, like should we be breathing? Um, obviously, we'll be affecting things like speech and balance, but also temperature regulation. Um, and as we get a little bit further into the drunken spectrum, 0.3 and higher, um, now we can end up in the area where we have serious um, problems that could happen. Not just could this individual become unconscious and enter into coma. Also, sometimes they can end up dying because, again, the brain stem becomes, um, is, is not functioning properly. At this point, we can have issues with very basic things like bladder control and breathing. And if we get higher than 0.4, most people are not going to survive this because at this point, our impaired functions are going to include our heart rate. Um, and obviously, once that goes, the individual is not going to survive. So this is the progressive effects of alcohol. Um, I want to say drunkenness, but really, as we get into here, we're getting into poisoning levels and obviously the function on the individual and the regions of the brain that are affected. So we've clearly have discussed some of the adverse effects of alcohol consumption. Um, the organ function is going to be one of the first major effects. So we're going to have loss of or uh, lower amounts of organ function for several hours after ingestion. And if we are going to consume alcohol chronically, that means that we consume it uh, multiple days a week, if not daily, this can interfere with our nutritional status. We start interfering with metabolism. Sometimes we produce toxic compounds and byproducts. And the effects of alcohol can vary with life stages. This is one of the reasons why it's recommended that people wait until 21 to begin imbibing because their organs are still developing in their teenage years. And the effects of alcohol um, are going to be much more drastic on preteens and teenagers than they are on adults, formed livers, etc. Um, now, again, we talk about the fact that alcohol is going to start being broken down by alcohol dehydrogenase, the liver, etc., and eventually we're going to exceed that capability. So when the intake exceeds the ability of the liver to actually break it down, we end up in alcohol intoxication, and eventually we can end up into alcohol poisoning. And again, this happens because the circulated alcohol is going to affect the entire central nervous system, including different parts of the brain, um, which can affect breathing and heart rates. Now, we can also have issues later, right? So even though we might not still be drunk the next morning, we can still have issues because of the alcohol that we consumed the night before. It can cause um, abnormal sleep cycles, can cause things like hangovers, which will be um, issues with bright light, um, headaches, nausea, very thirsty, um, fatigue. Sometimes you can get tremors or sweating. Or um, as we get into the point of alcohol dependency, then you get into anxiety, irritability, and um, needing to have another drink. Now, alcoholic beverages often have something that's called a congener in it, and these are actually going to contribute to hangover symptoms. So part of what you're feeling when you're feeling the hangover is not just the residual effects of the alcohol itself, but also congeners, which can help contribute to why you feel sick. This is why certain people can't drink particular drinks, like they might be able to drink one drink but not another, um, because they might be able to sense things like tannins and the wines or whatnot, things that might make them more sick than if they imbibed in a different alcoholic beverage. On top of that, alcohol is also a diuretic. That means that it's going to cause you to urinate out more liquid volume than you have brought in, which can lead to dehydration and imbalances in your electrolyte concentration. So it's always best to try to mix one glass of water in between every alcoholic beverage, um, or if you can, to mix in some Gatorade so we can get our electrolytes back in there as well. Um, alcohol can also interact with hormone levels, particularly with the hormones that are going to be involved in sugar balance or blood glucose level, including insulin and glucagon. It can also affect parathyroid hormone, which is involved in um, keeping your bone mass in, in, um, in balance, and so that can increase your risk of osteoporotic activities or breaks. And in women, alcohol can increase your estrogen levels, which is associated with an increased risk of breast cancer. And in both male and females, it can affect your reproductive hormones, which can cause sexual dysfunction in both males and females. 
Additionally, alcohol has completely empty calories. It provides seven calories per gram, which contributes to weight gain, um, and increases fat around weight around the stomach, etc., without actually providing any nutritional value. So although you're getting calories in, you're basically getting completely empty calories. And these alcoholic calories sometimes displace nutritious foods. So you might choose to drink your dinner instead of eating your dinner, which means that you might not be getting nutrients in, even though you're getting the calories in. So on top of that, even if you are eating the correct calories, excessive alcohol can interfere with the absorption of these nutrients. I'm sorry, even if you are eating the right amount of nutrients, it can interfere with the absorption of certain um, certain nutrients such as zinc, magnesium, thiamine, folate, different vi B vitamins, A, D, E, and K vitamins, as well as proteins. Um, and an example of how this can affect you if you were to end up low in thiamine or if thiamine deficient, that can affect your brain function and can increase the risk of particular diseases. So alcohol can be harmful to your digestive organs, to your heart, to your liver. We've talked about these. Uh, well, not the heart yet. Oh. But also, it can cause inflammation of the esophagus. It can cause cancers, esophageal cancer, mouth and throat cancers. It can cause um, ulcers in the stomach, which can cause gastritis. And additionally, it can cause issues with your heart tissue. It can cause hypertension or high blood pressure. And it can cause lesions in the heart or damage to your heart tissue. But pro the main organ that's going to feel the damage of a lifetime of alcoholic dependency is your liver. And your alcoholic liver disease pre um, proceeds in three stages. The first stage is a fatty liver. So we're starting to have um, fat deposits in the liver. And then the next part is alcoholic hepatitis. I mean, you think of hepatitis, you think of an infection, right? You think of hepatitis C, hepatitis A, et cetera, right? Um, but actually, hepatitis just means that we have a inflammation in the liver tissue, and that can happen from alcoholic dependency too. So alcoholic hepatitis is next. And then cirrhosis would happen after that. Here we have a normal liver on the left. Here's a liver with cirrhotic lesions. As you can see, we have all these nodules on here. And this liver is only going to be functioning at a percentage capacity of this liver in terms of a limit toxins. That means an individual struggling with cirrhosis is going to have a harder time metabolizing, metabolizing the alcohol, so they will actually end up with more circulating alcohol in their bloodstream than an individual with a normal, normal liver. Um, so long-term excessive alcohol consumption is going to cause damage to the liver. So again, fa fatty liver first, alcoholic hepatitis next, and then cirrhosis is going to be the progression. It can also cause hypertension or heart disease um, and stroke and increase your risk for cancer. Here's a percentage of fatal alcohol, uh, feeder cancers that are related to alcohol. Over 75% of esophageal cancers are related to alcohol, 50% of mouth cancers, 50% of larynx cancers, and 30% of liver cancers are related to alcohol. Um, and here's the esophageal cancer survival rate after the original diagnosis. So once you're diagnosed with esophageal cancer, you have at half a year, we have 62% survival. At one year, 36, and once you hit a couple years out, the four-year mark, you have a 3% survival rate. So esophageal cancer is very devastating, um, and obviously if it's going to have 75% due to um, alcohol addiction and dependency, then it's entirely or almost entirely preventable. So, um, you know, think about these sorts of things before you excessively imbibe on your weekends. Um, particularly think about these things if you're intending to get pregnant. So this is what happens with individuals who are pregnant and imbibe excessively. So this is a fetal alcohol syndrome, which is characterized by a couple of different things. First and foremost is classified by a mental deficiency. Um, but some of the physical characteristics include having a smaller head, and odd skin folds over the eyes, smaller eye openings than an average individual. The br nasal bridge, which ought to be up here, is going to be a little bit lower in the face. The nose is a little bit upturned, and the area that's called the philtrum, which is the groove between the no nose and the upper lip, is almost entirely absent. It's certainly indistinct. Additionally, we're going to have a very flat face and a very thin upper lip. Um, this is what's going to occur, again, if a fetus has been exposed to alcohol for excessive periods in the womb. Now, alcohol dependency and alcohol abuse is a very fine line between abuse and alcoholism. Well, different forms of alcohol abuse include any time that you overdrink, um, binge drinking, any time that you drink and drive, or ha operate heavy machinery, or are in charge of um, children, etc. Um, underage drinking, basically any time that you are going to be violating the drinking laws, it's going to be considered a form of alcohol abuse. Uh, and binge drinking is classified as consuming five drinks in one sitting by men, or four drinks in one sitting by women. And binge drinking is associated with an increased likelihood of injuries, car accidents, um, unplanned sexual activity, death, drowning, dismemberment, etc. 
Um, it's associated also with sexual aggression, including sexual assaults, physical assaults, um, suicide and homicide, again, with those emotional, heightened emotional behaviors, child abuse and health problems, including hypertension, heart attack, and STD transmission. Binge drinking can be detrimental to the individual because it can cause blackouts and lead to alcohol poisoning. And chronic drinking or drinking over your entire lifespan can lead to alcohol tolerance, which means that the brain has become, become less sensitive to the alcohol, meaning that you're going to need to drink more to get the same intoxicated effect, meaning that your liver is going to be under more and more and more strain as you continuously increase your alcohol tolerance. Um, they use this particular tool called CAGE to screen if um, patients have problems controlling their alcohol consumption. Uh, basically, they'll ask you a bunch of questions in the questionnaire, and if you answer honestly, they'll be able to determine if you are um, using alcohol as a crutch, essentially. Um, some consequences of college binge drinking include high levels of assaults. Number of college students that have gotten into issues with assaults um, between 18 and 24 per year is approximately 700,000. For injuries, we're approximately 600,000. Sexual assaults, almost 100,000. And deaths, nearly 2,000, all associated with college binge drinking. So again, as you guys are college students in this bracket, please be mindful and careful of these practices on your weekends. Um, speaking of um, bad practices, drinking and driving, obviously in most states it's illegal to drink and drive. The BAC limit for most states is 0.08, in some states it's 0.1, but even one drink is enough to impair your, impair your alertness, your judgment, and your coordination. Um, underage drinking can, insult, can increase its own host of issues, including increased violence and injuries and health risks, and also it can interfere with brain development, which means that we can have memory damage as adults if we drink excessively as teenagers. Um, underage drinking and driving is much more risky because underage drinkers are, tend to be less um, appropriate drivers anyway, and they don't have the same alcohol tolerance that adults perhaps have. So underage drinking and driving is a compoundly risky behavior. And um, as I mentioned previously, the earlier you start drinking, the higher the risk for alcoholism and alcohol dependency. All right, so alcohol as a disease has four classic signs and symptoms. The first is a craving for alcohol. If you don't get it, you start to get edgy, you start to think about it more and more, and it consumes your entire push for the day. Um, Additionally, individuals that continue to drink even though they've encountered physical, psychological, and social problems due to their alcohol use or have issues controlling or limiting their intake, I'll just have one and then they have ten, um, or find themselves with a dependency on alcohol as in that they cannot get themselves to do anything without first having a drink. Um, they'll use it as a crutch to be able to get out the door, for example. All of these are classic symptoms of alcoholism. And an alcohol abuser is going to be a little bit different from an alcoholic in the fact that they have a little bit more control over their cravings. They don't have loss of control of their life, and they have less dependency on alcohol, whereas an alcoholic is going to succumb to the cravings, loss of control, and alcohol dependency. This does tend to be genetic. Children of alcoholics are four times more susceptible to become alcoholics themselves, both from genetic factors and also from lifestyle choices. They may see their parents drinking more often and may drink at a younger age because it's available and seems socially acceptable. Um, environment also has an impact. The influences include things like your home life and the habits of your families and your friends. As I just mentioned, if you see it all the time at your house, it doesn't seem abnormal. Um, also, your social preference, pressure, uh, social pressures, as well as your access to alcohol. If it tends to be something that's always in the cabinet and mom might not notice that you take a little bit of it, you tend to be more likely to drink at a younger age. Um, now, alcoholism has no cure, but does have several treatment options. So one, we can treat an um, alcoholic with medication to help reduce the cravings that they are having. We can also send them to counseling for psychological help and support. And generally, the treatment options are a complete elimination of alcohol. And one of the ways that individuals find that they're able to um, get to the point where they've completely eliminated alcohol is by going to meetings where other alcoholics share their stories and encouragement, such as Alcoholics Anonymous, which is a 12-step recovery um, program and supportive group meetings that are entirely anonymous so you can share your story without feeling judgment. All right, so I talked about all of the negative effects of alcohol consumption, but it, there are a couple of moderate drinking benefits. So moderate drinking would mean no more than one drink for women and two drinks per day for men. Um, and moderate drinking does have a number of benefits, including has the lowest mortality rate, so it has a much lower mortality rate than non-drinkers or low drinkers, definitely lower than high drinkers, and you have a reduced risk of heart disease and stroke. 
particularly if you take a combination of phytochemicals or phenols with alcohol, and that's because it's going to be a blood thinner, and so it's going to help reduce your blood clots, etc., in your blood supply. So alcohol consumption in moderate levels does have benefits for your cardiovascular health in that it increases your LDL, or sorry, increases your HDL, which is your healthy cholesterol. It decreases your LDL or your lousy cholesterol. It decreases blood clotting and platelet aggregation as well as cell aggregation. And all of this is going to help keep your blood flowing smoothly with less clots and aggregates. So it's beneficial for your cardiovascular health. However, if you drink in excess, all of a sudden you end up with increased levels of acetaldehyde. And as I mentioned, acetaldehyde is a toxin. It's going to help increase your oxidative stress. That increases your triglyceride level, and it's going to decrease your HDL. Remember previously we saw an increase in our HDL? Too much. You lose that benefit. Same thing with the cell aggregation. You lose that benefit as well, and you also increase your reactive species. So if you drink in excess, it's actually going to be far worse for your cardiovascular health than not drinking at all. So what are some safe drinking practices? Well, there are some women that should completely avoid alcohol, including pregnant women. It has been shown that very low doses of alcohol do not hurt the fetus in pregnancy, but what's not been determined is the actual threshold. So we don't know where the cutoff is. So it's safest for pregnant women to just avoid alcohol altogether so that they can avoid fetal alcohol syndromes. Um, children and adolescents, anyone who is going to have their brain still in the process of developing, should be avoiding alcohol and alcohol dependency. Um, anyone who plans to drive or operate machinery, individuals who have an alcoholic dependency issue such as alcoholics, and anyone who's taking medications that interact with alcohol. Um, as I mentioned previously, drinking is a very personal choice, and it should take into account multiple things, such as your medical history and social considerations, i.e. are you intending to watch children or drive or operate machinery. And if you do choose to drink, you should do so in moderation, slowly, and with meals, because that's going to slow the rate of alcohol absorption. Thank you so very much for listening to my lecture today. I appreciate you sticking around. Mahalo and happy studying.